topic, the power of his touch. Yeah. As it is written here in the bulletin, the power of his touch. Uh, in my life, I have uh, rarely experienced any kind of sickness, but uh, after coming here last year, uh, September, I was diagnosed with cancer. So I really needed, of course, medical care, but besides that, I needed the touch. <laughs> Everybody does, right? Yes, so I really longed for God's touch, God's healing. God's touch means healing. God's uh, uh, grace, God's healing is, uh, it became so necessary in my life, especially after having been diagnosed with sickness. So I really started to pray more and more, harder and harder. Spent most of the time praying, God, please heal me, touch me with your healing power, and please open the way for me so that I can be healed, restore my voice, so that I can be your mouthpiece. That was my prayer. And basing on those backgrounds, uh, I have chosen this topic, the power of his touch. Touch means healing. Uh, basing on Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. Uh, shall we read this passage all together? And before, uh, after reading this, if I say uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, please open your Bible and read out for me, please. Help us so that we can finish early. Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. <laughs> and now, uh, Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 to 8. First, we'll read together. After that, I'll tell uh, to read the other passages. So, shall we read all together? One, two, go. Jesus heals a man with leprosy. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, a large crowd followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, See that you don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Amen? Amen. This is a wonderful story that is quite relevant with all of us, not only physically, but spiritually. Mentally, isn't it? When we come to the Lord with some need, God will never say, I'm not willing. But He will say, I'm willing. Amen. Isn't it? Amen? Amen. Praise God. Uh, basing on this background, I first want to uh, explain a little bit about this uh, and compare this word touch. We see we have five senses. Isn't it? We human beings, we have five senses. One is sight, isn't it? One is hearing. The other one is taste, smell, and finally, feeling or touch, isn't it? Feeling or touch. When we touch someone, there is, we create some kind of relationship, isn't it? Bonding. Some kind of change takes place when we touch each other. And you see, among these five senses, the last one, touch or feeling, this one is quite different. For example, sometimes when we become old, we may lose our hearing, isn't it? Sometimes our eyes become dim. We may lose our eyesight. Or we can, when we are sick, we may lose our sense of taste. And when we are feeling uh, like our, when, when we have a runny nose, maybe we can lose the taste of the sense of smell, isn't it? But how about this word touch? Sense. As long as we are alive, this sense called touch, we can never lose, isn't it? You touch someone, you feel. When I, when I carry a small baby in my 
my arms. Th those children, they just want to touch my hand because my hand is hairy. They just want to play. <laughs> <laughs> so there is some relationship, isn't it? Bonding like that. So touch has a different kind of sense. But again, we know that this touch uh, is, it has to do with uh, our physical, mental, psychological sense. But today, basing on Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 to 4, I want to pick, I want to share on the perspective of touch in the sense of spiritual touch. The touch of God. The touch of Jesus. You see. Many people were healed and changed and restored when Jesus stretched out his hand and touched them. That was not merely physical touch. It was the touch of God. That makes the difference again. We know that the Physical touch is also different, but again, this spiritual touch, also known as the touch of God, is totally different again. It is from the spiritual realm, R-E-A-L-M. My pronunciation is not very good, but it is uh, the, <laughs> the spiritual realm. Yeah, so uh, it is really, really different. And you see, now I'm touching a table, isn't it? This table, the pulpit. We touch, my, we touch many things every day, every day throughout our life, isn't it? So this touching makes a connection. Uh, we may touch somebody out of love or because of passion or because of caring or uh, knowingly, unknowingly, these things. But it is sometimes we touch others out of curi curiosity. Suppose if you go to the museum, we see many artifacts, many things of interest, isn't it? So. We just take it and, oh wow, such mastercraft, isn't it? Like this, we touch and we make a bond, we make some relationship, connection, isn't it? Through touch. And as I've said before, this touch it, that is contained in the Bible, particularly in Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 to 4, this part is quite different. As I've said, uh, it is the spiritual touch and it is the touch of God, which is quite different. And you see, when God touch you purposefully, when God touch you purposefully, we will never be the same again. We will never be the same again. Some great change will take place. Naturally, it takes place. And it will change our whole course of life. So this is one particular different thing. For example, we see that Abraham, he was a nomad, isn't it? He was wandering from one country to another country. One place to another place. He was a shepherd. He was a cattle rarer. So in order to, feel, to search in search of pastures, he was moving from one place to another place. He was a nomad. He was a rover. He was not a constant person. He was not a city dweller. At the time, his name was... Abraham, isn't it? Abraham means just wanderer. See, spiritually we might we could be wandering, isn't it? A wanderer without fixed faith. But when God touched him, he became Abraham. He became Abraham. He became the father of Israel. When he laid his hands upon the people of Israel, they were blessed extremely. Because God first touched him. See, this is the difference. We also know that uh, when God touched Moses, you see, Moses was a murderer, number one. Moses was a very angry man, very sharp tempered. <laughs> see, when he murdered, in a sense, when he was in Egypt, in the Pharaoh's court, he saw that one. Egyptian man killing one Hebrew guy. So what did he do? He killed him secretly, but somebody saw him, isn't it? He was a martyr. He was very angry. Angry man. When he went to Mount Sinai, God gave him the two tablets, Ten Commandments. When he came down to the foothill, 
Israelites were already worshipping a golden calf. Isn't it? With the gold and the materials which were collected from them, they have already started uh, worshipping a golden calf. Isn't it? So what did he do? He became so angry. He couldn't control himself. He just smashed those Ten Commandments tablets into pieces. That was the sin. That was the reason why he couldn't enter the promised land called Canaan. Angry man, murder. But when God touched him, he became the most humble person ever lived on this earth. From angry man to humble man. And from Sometimes we are also identified in such situation, isn't it? Sometimes we cannot be humble. Sometimes we get angry. But if God touched us, when we go back to our country, so we need God's touch. And also we know about James and John. James and John, before they were called by Jesus, they were called the sons of thunder. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> we are the boss, like this, in their territory. Nobody could come before them. James and John, they were like that kind of person. That's why they were termed as the sons of thunder. Thunder means big song, isn't it? They used to roar. We are the boss. This is our territory. Like that. So those were, that was their former life. But when Jesus called them and touched them, they became the sons of love, isn't it? Love. That was their tech. And when God touched Saul, he was a murderer. He, he, he killed many Christians. He was the, the persecutor of Christians, Paul, uh, Saul, during the time. But on the way to Damascus, he was going to Damascus to kill and to persecute Christians. But when Jesus touched him on the way, a dramatic situation took place, isn't it? A lightning struck him and he became blind. And after that, he, he changed. He was totally changed and became the most powerful evangelist. The most famous propagator of the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, he, he established many, many churches around uh, Asia, Asia Minor, around the world. And he wrote uh, these 13 epistles, which we read today in the Bible here. We have 13 epistles written by this person. Formerly he was known as Saul, but now he is called Paul, isn't it? We st were re still reading the epistles that he has written. Now, we can clearly understand that God's touch is divine. God's touch is divine. God's touch can transform. God's touch is very, very powerful. It can change anything. Basing on this background, uh, and again, coming back to the background of Jesus Christ's life, let us showcase the power of touch. First one, number one, it transforms the diseased. It transforms the diseased. Matthew chapter 8, 15. Shall we read together? Someone, please. Matthew 8, 15. Yes. He touched her hand and the fever left her. And she got up and began to wait on him. Yes. This one, this her here, it refers to uh, Peter's mother-in-law. She was sick. She was in a very, very hopeless condition. Jesus was in the room. But because of her sickness, he, she couldn't serve him. He was rendered helpless and hopeless situation. Now, the thing is, when Jesus touched her, you see, she became fully strong. She could stand up and she started waiting upon them. Waiting means serving, isn't it? Many of us are identified in this situation. Because of our 
physical, mental, and spiritual sickness, even though we have the power to serve God, sometimes we become so poor and helpless. We cannot serve God. We cannot do something good. But if we go to the Lord, He will say, Come, my son, my child, my daughter. I want to heal you. I want to touch you. And I want to make you whole again so that you may glorify my name and extend God's kingdom on this earth. So when we have some problem, we shouldn't say that we are having this, this kind of infirmities, problems, difficulties. No, but go to the Lord and He will touch us and make us whole again. Secondly, God's touch can, it can transform the death. It can transform the death. Uh, Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 7, verse 33. Someone please read. Mark chapter 7, verse 33. Okay, it's here. <laughs> yes. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he took it and touched the man's tongue. Yes. And you see, the... <clears throat> <clears throat> Here is a person who is both deaf and mute. Both. They couldn't hear, they couldn't speak. Both. There are two things. Now, in our life, sometimes we are Christians, so we listen to, we hear God's word, we read the Bible, but sometimes we fail to listen. <laughs> our physical ears are okay, no problem, but still there. Well, sometimes we fail to hear and to heed God's word. Like this person here who was uh, deaf and mute. But when uh, Jesus touched him, everything changed. And uh, you see, he can do this to all of us. We are all sinners. So if we, uh, if we are saved by God, see, if we are saved by God, we, God can give us the ability to listen and to hear His Word. Listening to His Word can lead us to heaven. But not listening to God's Word can lead us, you know, where, isn't it? Don't. We will never go ahead in life. We will never reach the kingdom of God. So, let us hear and heed to the Word of God and let us speak to him clearly. Like when this person was restored, he could hear, he could speak clearly, isn't it? Lord, thank you. I want to do as you say, like that. We can tell him clearly. So listen to God's word. Say yes to God's calling. Heed to what he says. Then we can be saved. Amen? Amen. The third point is, it transforms the darkened. Amen. What is darkness? Please close your eyes, everybody. One, three seconds. Please close your eyes. Okay, open and please look here at the cross. <laughs> what is the difference? When you are closing your eyes and looking here, after looking at the cross, the difference was when your eyes are closed, it became very dark. Isn't it? You couldn't see anything. But when you open your eyes, you look at the cross, you see something beautiful. God's glory is shining, isn't it? God's presence, we feel the presence of God. So, sometimes, physically, our eyes are okay, we can see, but we tend to close our spiritual eyes. That is the problem in our Christian life. So, in order to let God open our spiritual eyes, we need to go forward to Him. We need to ask Him, Lord, I can see it uh, physically, but I, I need my spiritual eyes to be opened. Please open my eyes so that uh, I can see you. I can see your glory. I can see that where I should go and work for you. So let us uh, ask ourselves, am I in darkness? Am I in darkness or am I in the light? Let us ask this question. And uh, if God opened our eyes, our spiritual eyes, then we can see everything in the perspective of God. We can see everything in His perspective. Everything becomes good. 
everything becomes straight. There is no stumbling block, but it becomes very clear. Fourth, and the last point is, it transforms the dead. It transforms the dead. God's touch can really make a dead person alive. Luke chapter 8, verse 54. Luke chapter 8, verse 54. Uh, in this context, okay, so we first read this one. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Get up. See? Get up. At this situation, uh, the girl already died, but Jesus took her by his arm and spoke to her, My child, get up. Don't sleep anymore. You are not dead, but you are alive. So uh, her life was restored by his touch, just one touch, and it was restored. So we know that there is nothing worse than death, isn't it? When we die, what is the use, isn't it? Can we see? Can we go? Can we eat? Can we be alive? No, nothing. Finished. Everything is finished. We are doomed. There is nothing left in us. So our body was created from dust. And again, we're going back to the dust when we die. But if we are raised by Christ, we will live forever. Amen. Amen? We will live forever. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, please let Jesus <coughs> raise you up. Amen. We don't have much time to be living in the darkness of sin. So let God raise us from this kind of death and condemnation. Mm. You see, doctors may cure. Doctor, when we are sick, doctors may cure you, me, and make us whole again. But it is just extension, isn't it? When you are sick, doctor cures you, but it is extension. A year, five years, ten years. But not eternally, isn't it? Only God can give us eternal life. Amen. Only God can raise us and make us whole again, isn't it? Amen. Amen. So, likewise, that is why, that is the reason that God the Father raised His Son, Jesus Christ, from the dead. To show us that He has the power and the authority to even raise us again. Amen. Like He did to His Son, Jesus Christ. So, uh, in order to receive eternal life, we must be raised from sin. We must not be living in sin. Otherwise, our life will be wasted and uh, we will face doom. As we have discussed these three point, four points, God's touch can transform